Welcome to the Question Community Broadcast. The Question is a new disruptive community that provides a gathering place for those who wonder about our complex selves, our complex world, our complex universe. We are a non-religious and inclusive community that explores the many questions surrounding truth in order to encourage you on an important journey to find your own answers. The Question Community gathers every second Sunday evening at Loft 112 in the East Village neighborhood of Calgary starting at 7. Information on the community is available at our website, www.thequestion.ca. You can also join the community online at our Facebook page, which is The Question Community, and on Twitter, at TQCom with two M's. You're now going to hear some highlights from our community gathering, where the question is asked through original arts and music, as well as thought-provoking presentations. This is Frederick Tamaki. From last month, for those of you who are here, you may remember our friend, the Greek sculptor Polyclitus, who lived in the fifth century BC, and who first coined the term symmetria. Now, the ancient Greek word symmetria basically means agreement in dimensions, proportions, and arrangement, or the interplay of detail and dimension with balance and rhythm. Now, to the ancient Greeks, symmetry was not simply a clinical measurement of proportions. It was also an experience of harmony. Polyclitus' most famous work is called Doriphoros, or the spear bearer, in which he invested all of his creative and scientific ideas of balance, proportion, and beauty into an idealized form of the human. Polyclitus' vision of symmetria resonated throughout the entire artistic world for centuries to this very day, in fact. His ideas influenced such artists as Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and Rodin to create many of the definitive studies of human symmetry and beauty in all of art history. It's important to remember that symmetry began as an artistic message. Remember that. Polyclitus, probably through observation and measurement, provided a kind of blueprint for artistic expressions of ideal humanity. He was trying to replicate that. So hold that thought, okay, for about 100 years or so. Now, in the fourth century BC, the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid, generally considered to be the father of modern geometry, was busy exploring the principles of his art. This is 100 years later. One of his most famous principles was a mathematical constant, 3.14, or pi, okay, which enables us to calculate the circumference or area of any circle by first knowing the radius or the diameter of the circle, like most of us remember pi from school, right? Okay, yes, good. Now, his second most famous principle was the mathematical constant, 1.61, or phi, which has come to be known as the golden ratio, or sometimes called the golden mean. In mathematics, two quantities are in the golden ratio if their ratio is the same, and I have the formulas down there, if the ratio of their sum uh, to the larger of the two quantities is the same. So both pi and phi are undoubtedly a useful principles for math-based pursuits. They totally are. But we'd be stretching a bit to ascribe philosophical or even spiritual significance to either of them, wouldn't we? Well, why don't we just stick to the science and see where that leads us. Everyone got phi now, 1.61? Now, Euclid found that the golden ratio was a mathematical constant in a whole range of geometric relationships between circles, triangles, pentagons, pentagrams, squares, rectangles, and many more. Especially significant was a geometric form that became known as the golden rectangle, and that's down in the far left corner. Okay? More on that later. Now, here's why we held our thoughts about Polyclitus the sculptor for that hundred years. Now, remember that I said Polyclitus may have observed and measured living specimens of so-called ideal human form and then sought to replicate that ideal form, a symmetry of form, in his sculptures. Well, inadvertently, and 100 years later, Euclid discovered the mathematics of that ideal form when he discovered the constant 1.61, or the golden ratio. Polyclitus literally sculpted the golden ratio into the Dory Forals and consequently into the very foundation of art forever. These comparative images are if he didn't use the golden ratio. You can see that the legs and, and the body seem kind of out of whack. Now, Polyclitus and Euclid are kind of like the symmetry soul brothers of the third and fourth centuries. Polyclitus's principles of symmetry 
prompted him to sculpt the visible human expressions of golden ratio. For example, the figure of the Dory Forest reflects both an aesthetic and a mathematical proportionality that aligns with the golden ratio. In humans and many other animals, the internal bone structure of fingers, hands, arms, and legs also more or less align with the golden ratio. I didn't know this. Okay? Now, these are very quiet examples of a pretty spectacular question, but it may be easier to just reflect on how creativity and science are mysteriously intertwined around the same truth. Don't think Polycletus presumed that his art was necessarily intertwined with algebra, geometry, calculus, architecture, or astrophysics for that matter, but he did recognize the message of symmetry. A century later, it was Euclid, the scientist, that found the symmetry within. Now, the easiest way to describe the significance of the golden ratio is that it came to represent the ideal mathematical expression of dimension, balance, and harmony in both art and architecture for centuries following Euclid. Basically, the ratio became the mathematical inspiration for our concepts of symmetry. Structures from the Parthenon to the Taj Mahal to the Cathedral of Notre Dame, works of art from Michelangelo's David to Da Vinci's Last Supper to Stradivari's violins. In the case of Stradivarius, does anyone find it interesting that an instrument visually crafted around the golden ratio is also recognized as the most harmonically perfect instrument of its kind? I found that kind of interesting. All of these examples and countless others are said to exhibit inspiration from the golden ratio. I'm not finished. As you can see, the golden ratio is thought to be present across many other forms, animal forms, human forms, organic and non-organic, even cosmic forms. Now, we're familiar with the amazing visual symmetry of Saturn and its rings. This is an actual photograph of Saturn from the Cassini spacecraft, by the way. But is Saturn even more amazing when we see the symmetry overlaid on the golden ratio? I need to share one more amazing cosmic anecdote about the message of symmetry. I read a February 2015 article from Scientific American about how the Kepler Space Telescope has recently identified a group of pulsating stars that emit primary and secondary light bursts at intervals correlated to the golden ratio. Astrophysicists are wondering if this is just a freak occurrence or not. Okay, but even the most hardcore among us who are skeptics are going to be intrigued. Are you intrigued by this? I am. Yeah. Now, according to Mario Livio, he's a distinguished American astrophysicist and author. He's part of the technical team that operates the Hubble Space Telescope. The golden ratio is this important. Hope you can read that. I'll read it. Some of the greatest mathematical minds throughout human history have spent endless hours over the simple ratio and its properties. But the fascination with the golden ratio is not confined to just mathematicians. Biologists, artists, musicians, historians, architects, psychologists, and even mystics have pondered and debated the basis of its ubiquity and appeal. In fact, it's probably fair to say that the golden ratio has inspired thinkers of all disciplines like no other number in the history of mathematics. So take that pie. Well, that's a quote from me. Yeah. Okay, I'm now gonna take you just a little deeper into the question of the symmetry within. I didn't want to mention it, but I thought I would because just in case you noticed it and wanted to mention it, I'll mention it for you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take you a little deeper into the question of the symmetry within. Remember that I said the Greek model of symmetry was more than just a static form. It was a living relationship, an interplay of detail and dimension with balance and rhythm. The sculptures of Polycletus, combined with the mathematics of Euclid, expanded this living relationship into a new expression of symmetry. So detailed dimension, balance, rhythm, beauty, harmony, and mathematics became the guiding message of symmetry for us. But even further embedded in the message of symmetry, even deeper, is another amazing mathematical phenomenon that is both fact and mystery at the same time. Has anyone ever heard the word Fibonacci before? Yeah, so a few of us have. Okay, so some of you have heard this word, and you probably remember it if you heard it. That's because it's not exactly an everyday, forgettable kind of word. Now, I'd heard of Fibonacci, even kind of knew what it referred to, 
but they didn't really know how significant it was to the message of symmetry. In the year 1202, an Italian mathematician named Leonardo of Pisa was exploring a new theory of predictive statistics. He was reportedly doing research to advance the profession of bookkeeping and accounting. He decided to explore the theoretical problem of mating rabbits to develop and illustrate this new statistical theory. Mating rabbits, okay? The problem was to determine how many pairs of rabbits would exist after one year if a single male and a single female were introduced into an ideal biologically protected environment. Not sure where he came up with this. The cumulative number of rabbit pairs by month for 12 months yielded a new numbering system where the predicted numbers were the sum of the two preceding numbers, okay? The predicted numbers were the sum of the two preceding numbers. It looked like this. Can everyone see that? Zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377, and so on, okay? So the sum of the two preceding numbers is the final number, so on. Leonardo's new system, which eventually became known as the Fibonacci sequence, ended up not having a practical application in bookkeeping. So it remained obscure in the world of mathematics for over 500 years. By the way, Fibonacci was Leonardo's nickname. Okay, it's a rough version of son of Bonacci, which was his father's name. So that's where Fibonacci came from. Has everyone got Fibonacci now? Okay. Then in 1750, a Scottish mathematician named Robert Simpson resurrected interest in Fibonacci's numbering system. This is 1750, okay, over 500 years later. While he was doing his own research into the geometric theories of the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid. Okay, so Simpson was studying Euclid. Now, please stay with me through this mathletics interlude, okay? It'll be worth it, trust me. This is Tim Garrow. We all, as I mentioned already, we all have unique gifts, and uh, it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, we, we all have the ability to affect others and in a positive way, and that's what this song's about. So, put on your earplugs for the uh, harmonica. I'll back off a little bit for that. <laughs> Thank you. 
So we have Robert Simpson in 1750, Fibonacci in 1202, and Euclid in 300 BC. Now we know that Euclid was the first to discover mathematics in the message of symmetry. What do Fibonacci and Simpson have to do with that message? Well, Robert Simpson was the first mathematician to notice that Fibonacci sequence numbers correlated with Euclid's golden ratio. I'm gonna repeat that, okay. Simpson was the first mathematician to discover that Fibonacci's sequence of numbers correlated with Euclid's golden ratio. Now, Fibonacci and the golden ratio correlate in this way. The ratio of virtually all Fibonacci numbers, starting at the number five, divided by its preceding number, approximates 1.61, which just happens to be the golden ratio. Strange, right? Let's have a look at that. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. So no matter how far you go up in Fibonacci numbers, because they basically go on to infinity, the ratio is always 1.61 between one Fibonacci number and its preceding number. So over a span of 2,000 years, Euclid's famous mathematical expression of universal symmetry became intertwined with Fibonacci's obscure sequence of numbers developed from the theoretical mating habits of rabbits. Now, this strange mathematical intertwining on its own was apparently not considered that earth-shattering in Simpson's time. In fact, it only merited a brief mention in one of his academic journals. It was perhaps just an odd mathematical coincidence. It was another century or so before the coincidence began to resemble synchronicity. See, Jonathan, I had to get that in there. So, so stay with me, okay, mathletes. Here's why this coincidence is important. Now, beginning in the 19th century, all scientific disciplines began to uncover the full expression of symmetry in our world and in the larger universe. What was gradually discovered was an amazing synthesis of the golden ratio and Fibonacci embedded in both living and non-living forms, in the organic and inorganic expressions of symmetry. Now this synthesis of golden ratio and Fibonacci was truly the symmetry within symmetry. I'm gonna explain this to you just a little bit. Now, this is Euclid's famous golden triangle, okay, sectioned into what are called Fibonacci squares. Okay? Fibonacci squares represent the increasing proportional area occupied by Fibonacci sequence of numbers. Okay? So at the very center of the Fibonacci square is the number one, and then Fibonacci sequence coils around into the larger and larger proportions. Okay, with me so far? Okay. To the right is the same golden rectangle, with the Fibonacci squares overdrawn with a corresponding spiral form. Now the spiral contains the same increasing Fibonacci numbers, the same increasing Fibonacci proportions, all right? Now, I've already shared uh, multiple real world examples of the golden ratio on its own, but let me share some new examples of the golden ratio Fibonacci synthesis as expressed in symmetry. Flower seed heads, okay. Typically flower seeds are produced 
at the center and then migrate towards the outside to fill the space. Sunflowers provide a great example of these spiraling patterns. In some cases, the seed heads are so tightly packed, as you can see here, that the total number of the heads can get quite high, as many as 144 or more. And when counting these spirals, the total number tends to match a Fibonacci number. You can see that we've got two spirals here, 34 and 21. Okay? 34 seeds and 21 seeds, both are Fibonacci numbers. And it's the same for every spiral. Pine cones. Seed pods in a pine cone are also arranged in a spiral pattern. Each cone consists of a pair of spirals, each one spiraling upwards in opposite directions. Now, the number of steps will almost always match a pair of consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Likewise, spiral Fibonacci sequences can also be found in pineapples and cauliflower. It's replicated in many, many places in the plant and vegetable world. Here's another one, logarithmic spirals. Snail shells, nautilus shells, follow a Fibonacci-based logarithmic spiral. You can see I have a rendering of the golden rectangle up in the upper left-hand corner with the Fibonacci spiral in it. So snail shells, nautilus shells, follow a Fibonacci-based logarithmic spiral, as does the cochlea of the human inner ear. That's an electron microscope photograph of a cochlea. It can also be seen in the horns of sheep and goats and the shape of certain spider webs. Even the microscopic ovaries of the anglerfish express the Fibonacci logarithmic spiral. The other image, by the way, is a micrograph of a cancer cell dividing. Hurricanes, spiral galaxies, also follow the familiar Fibonacci golden ratio pattern. You can see that the Fibonacci golden rectangle is superimposed on both of those. Spiral galaxies have several arms each of them a distinct logarithmic spiral. Now, as an interesting sub-question, spiral galaxies appear to defy Newtonian physics. As early as 1925, astronomers realized that since the rotational speed of the galactic disk in the center varies with distance from the center, the radial arms of the galaxy should be more curved as the galaxy rotates. So subsequently, after a few rotations, the spiral arms should actually start to wind more tightly around the galaxy, okay? but they don't. The stars on the outside of the galaxy move at a velocity higher than expected. Now, this contradictory movement actually maintains the Fibonacci shape of the galaxy. It's an open and controversial question as to whether or not embedded Fibonacci is a factor beyond the mere visual symmetry of galaxies. But Scientists cannot explain why the spiral arms of galaxies do not wrap more tightly around the center. We've seen how the golden ratio of Fibonacci numbers are present within spiral symmetry forms. But here's some other cool examples of this golden relationship in the message of symmetry. Flower petals, okay, with some exceptions, the number of petals in a flower consistently follows the Fibonacci sequence. Famous examples include the lily, which has three petals, buttercups have five, chicory has 21, daisies 34, and so on. It's rare, it's a rare occurrence when flowers don't have a Fibonacci number of petals. And it's been theorized that exceptions to this principle are only due to genetic defects or aberrant growing conditions, just weird outside forces. Here's another one, tree branches. The Fibonacci sequence can also be seen in the way tree branches form or split. Now, a main trunk will grow until it produces a branch, which creates two growth points. Then one of the new stems branches into two, while the other one lies dormant. This pattern of branching is repeated for each of the new stems. In addition, most underground root systems exhibit the Fibonacci pattern as well. DNA. The DNA molecule measures 34 angstroms long by 21 angstroms wide for each full cycle of the double helix. Okay, 34 by 21 for each cycle. These numbers, 34 and 21, are Fibonacci numbers. And the ratio is 1.61, which happens to be the golden ratio. A DNA could be one of the most foundational examples of the symmetry within. It's amazing to me, actually. Okay. What does all this mean? Clearly, I'm not gonna say that I know exactly what it means, 
because just like you, I'm pretty amazed, inspired, and mystified by all of it. What I do know is that Fibonacci and the golden ratio appear to be just alternative expressions of the very same message, like the front and back doors to the very same house. It should be an adequate mystery, shouldn't it, to merely observe the message of symmetry in us, in the world around us, and in the greater universe beyond us. That should be adequate. But once we've been exposed to the wondrous mathematics of the golden ratio in Fibonacci, can we really claim that mere observation is adequate? The greater mystery may well be about what cannot be seen, but only calculated. So here's some final questions for you. Is the message of symmetry more powerful with the knowledge that there is a deeper mathematical system embedded within the symmetry that we can see. This is Hurricane Sandy, by the way. As you look at planets and galaxies that express the symmetry of the golden ratio in Fibonacci, are you provoked by the possibility that this mathematical system has existed since the very beginning of time? Even if the universe was first created by the chaos of the Big Bang, is it possible that universal symmetry was actually constructed around a universal system of mathematics? Did we conceive this amazing system of mathematics, or did we merely uncover it? Or put another way, is this amazing symmetry within the outcome or the cause? OK, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for being so patient. Thank you for listening. You can participate in the online discussion on our Facebook page, which is The Question, or on Twitter at TQCOM. That's at T-Q-C-O-M-M. Our website is www.thequestion.ca. Thanks again for listening, and remember that our answers are only possible because of our questions.